I'm Matthew Wood here on Journeys to the Ice, the podcast of the Antarctic Research Centre, and this is the fourth of five podcasts on the ANZICE program. A model is a simplification of a complex set of natural processes into a system where the processes have been separated and quantified. In modern science, models are often constructed within computers, but are always built upon reliable empirical data sets. A good computer model can be an extremely powerful tool for both reconstructing and predicting the behaviour of natural systems. In this episode, Andrew McIntosh, who leads the climate modelling group within ANZICE, discusses his team's successes and ongoing challenges in modelling ice mass volume changes in both the polar ice shelves and in the temperate glacier field of the New Zealand Southern Alps. Well, welcome to the show, Andrew. Thanks for your time today. You're welcome. So to begin with, in a nutshell, what is a model? A model is some kind of simplification of reality, and it can be a computer model, which is the sort that we use, but it could also be some other sort of construction, conceptual model, Plato model. We use computer models because they provide an opportunity to learn about a real physical system like the climate or a glacier or so forth. So one of these computer models that your group has been working on is related to polar ice shelf stability. Could you tell us a little bit about this model and about some of its successes so far? Yeah, so this is work that's been led by Jeremy Fike, one of our PhD students, and uh, it's quite a complicated model in a way. It's a model that includes all of the major elements of the Earth system. So we're talking about the ocean and the atmosphere in particular and how they work together. And so with a model like that, you can ask it a question and it might give you an answer and uh, it might even be believable if the model's performing well. So in the case of Jeremy's work, he was very interested in ice shelves and whether they might break up in the future and so forth as the climate warms. And he was able to run his model with changing carbon dioxide as one of the inputs and calculate how stable ice shelves might be in the future. He started it in the past as well. So there's a part of his model that you might call hindcasting. It's a bit like forecasting, just to see whether it's doing a reasonable job for the past. And it does seem to do a pretty decent job. At the beginning of the 20th century, you can see areas of stable ice shelves in Greenland and in Antarctica, as we know they were. And then sort of at the end of the 20th century and into the beginning of the 21st century, something a bit funky starts going on and ice shelves start to become unstable. And by a thousand years into the future, it seems like quite a long way off, but gives us some idea of what's going on. There aren't any ice shelves left. They're all gone. It's still just a simplification of reality. We don't know how exactly how precise it is, but a model like that does give you some insight into you know, the workings of the system. It tells you the bits that are more likely to stay stable for a while, the bits that are more likely to break up first and so forth. So you've got some colleagues who are focusing on modelling systems in Antarctica and the northern polar regions, but an ongoing focus of your own personal research has been modelling the relationship between climate and the dynamics of the temperate glaciers in the New Zealand Southern Alps. Why is this kind of study important, particularly in this part of the world? I mean, I think that if you investigate temperate glaciers, you might have three main questions in mind. What did they do in the past? What have they done recently and what might they do in the future? And I think we've been trying to look at all three factors. My own interest is probably more in the past. The Southern Hemisphere is dominated by the ocean, in particular at the latitudes of New Zealand, 40, 50, 60 degrees south. It's mostly ocean. It's an ocean that is uh, very rough with very dynamic winds and so forth. And uh, in some ways they must drive the global climate system. We know that they have a profound influence on carbon dioxide and its variability through time. When the winds are slow in the southern hemisphere, the carbon dioxide gets locked up in the ocean and when the winds speed up, the carbon dioxide comes out again. And so by studying glaciers on land in these tiny bits of land that do appear within that overall dominant oceanic environment, we can learn quite a lot about the changes in that system as a whole. And so there are just these three areas that sort of poke into that southern westerly zone, Tasmania, New Zealand and South America. They hardly show up in a global climate model, but there are records preserved there. And we don't understand a lot of the climate processes that have occurred in that part of the world during recent, you know, ice ages. Uh, We don't actually even know why ice ages occur fundamentally. We thought we did, and I don't think we do anymore. And I think that Southern Hemisphere glaciers might hold the key to that. 
Now, I read recently that there are actually over 3,000 glaciers in the New Zealand Southern Alps, which was definitely a surprise to me because, I don't know, I can probably only name about half a dozen of them. But during historical times, what have the general trends been across those glaciers in terms of advance and retreat? So, I mean, the 3,000 glaciers in the Southern Alps, that number's correct, but most of them are quite small, like a kilometre or less in length. They're tiny. And then there are some rather large ones, the ones that we know about, like the Franz Josef Glacier and the Fox Glacier and the Tasman Glacier. And there are also a few others at Mount Cook National Park people might have visited, the Hooker Glacier, the Mueller Glacier, and so forth. Those glaciers have overall retreated in the last 150 years. In fact, they've lost about a third to half of their volume in terms of length change. That's something like four kilometres retreat on average. The response hasn't been the same in each case. There are, in fact, two different modes of glacier response that I can think of. One is the clean glacier response. And even tourists recognise this if they walk up to Franz Josef or Fox glaciers. These are nice, clean, shiny, beautiful tourist glaciers. Everyone enjoys visiting them. Those glaciers have responded quite differently to the ones in Mount Cook National Park, which are covered in debris and have lakes out the front, right? So the clean glaciers have been advancing and retreating. They've overall lost volume. Franz Josef Glacier has retreated by four and a half kilometres or something like that since the 19th century. But it's also re-advanced. So since about 1980, it has re-advanced by a kilometre. That's fascinating to us. We want to understand why has it re-advanced. In the case of the Mount Cook Glaciers, They've just slowly been thinning during the 20th century, not really retreating horizontally. But then just in the last few decades, something really dramatic has happened and they've formed large lakes at their front and those lakes have started to increase in size. And in the case of Tasman Glacier, that lake is now more than five kilometres long. It's a huge lake. So they're two different kinds of response. Yeah, I've been up on those Tasman moraines several times looking down at that glacial lake. And there's no trees around to provide a scale, but then occasionally one of those tourist speedboats will whiz past and suddenly you'll realise that, wow, this is really quite a massive feature. Does the formation of these pro-glacial lakes put this kind of glacier in danger of more rapid retreat? I mean, a lake carving glacier like that will retreat until it finds itself back, you know, in shallow water. So there's a big hole underneath the Tasman Glacier and as the ice retreats further into that hole, it's a sort of positive feedback, progressive retreat. Started off with warming in the 20th century, the lake formed, and now it's kind of got a mind of its own. It's continuing to retreat, you know, until it gets back into shallow water. And we know that there's a deep hole underneath the Tasman Glacier. It's uh, at least 600 metres deep at one point that's a few kilometres uphill of the present glacier terminus. So it's going to continue until it goes well through that hole and pops out the other end of it. People have been speculating about the sort of future of the Tasman Glacier for some time, and most people agree that it might retreat by up to 10 kilometres. It's quite a long way. You mentioned that some glaciers in the Southern Alps have actually advanced during the last 30 years, following a much longer term trend of retreat. What do you think was the ultimate driver of that anomalous advance? I guess I'll start with which glaciers have shown that advance, because there's a common misconception that it's just these West Coast glaciers, Fox and Franz Josef, There's a clean glacier just on the other side of the Alps that flows down to near Mount Cook Village called the Stocking Glacier, and it's behaved in almost precisely the same way. It's got a clean surface. There are also debris-covered glaciers on the western side of the Southern Alps that have behaved very much like Tasman Glacier. So it's just these clean surface glaciers that behaved a little bit like that. What's caused that advance? Well, there's been quite a lot of discussion of that and research on it over the years. I think that everybody agrees that that advance has occurred in relation to changing atmospheric circulation, right? So think about it this way, if the world's warming, and especially if somewhere like southeastern Australia starts to get really dry and hot, then the southern westerlies have moved a little bit further south, and they sort of spin around the bottom of Tasmania and come up towards Wellington or the southern Alps from the south, and everybody in Wellington knows what a strong southerly means, right? It's colder. And so that sort of changing atmospheric circulation Uh, more subtly airflow seems to be responsible for these advancing glaciers. There's been a sort of systematic change in atmospheric circulation during this period, the last couple of decades, that has resulted in that colder air and anomalous advance. It has also caused 
snowfall levels to be much higher. But of course, snow is not just related to the precipitation amount, it's also related to the air temperature. So if it's colder, then more of that rain gets converted to snow and the glaciers like that. So there's a combined impact of temperature and precipitation, but it's easier to think about that in terms of the atmospheric circulation as a whole. If there's more southerly winds, then more snow, less melt, the glaciers like that and start to advance. What New Zealand has experienced as a whole hasn't necessarily been an overall cooling. It's just the high mountain catchments that these glaciers flow from. And we don't have weather stations at high elevation, so nobody's measured that cooling directly. On the other side of the Alps, so on the eastern side in particular, there's been a warming, but we know there's quite large regional differences in climate in New Zealand. But anyway, in the mountains, it seems like there has been a very minor cooling. This is climate variability, not climate change. It's related to things like, you know, increasing frequency of El Nino events. El Nino Southern Oscillation is one of the most important and well understood climate variability processes in the Southern Hemisphere. There have also been changes in the Southern Annular Mode, which is another form of climate variability, which basically means the westerlies have moved a bit further south. In fact, those two are working in opposition with each other and we don't know which one's going to win in the future. Yeah. <laughs> I should probably mention Dr. Brian Anderson, who's been a long time collaborator with you on this research. Now, the two of you have spent quite a bit of time on the Brewster Glacier. Could you explain where Brewster is and why it's been a key field area for the two of you? Sure. So Brewster Glacier is located down near the Haast Pass. It's just above the pass, actually. If you drive over the pass, you can probably see it. And it's a very small glacier. It's only a few kilometres long. Nobody's heard of it because it's not at the road and it's quite small. The reason we work on it is that it's relatively easy to move around on. It's as simple as that. If you are lucky enough to fly over a glacier like Franz Josef, it's covered in crevasses, it's very hard to get to, it's incredibly difficult to work on. Brewster is relatively flat and we can work on it. It's important to study glaciers in some detail in order to really get a true picture of how they've been responding. Brewster is, in some respects, we can think of it as being representative of all the glaciers in the Southern Alps. We can just understand it properly because it's accessible. We've been measuring snowfall each year. We know how much snow has fallen. We've been measuring melt rates, so we know exactly how much melt has occurred. We can see whether those two have been in balance. So in some years, we can see the glacier has more snow than melt, and if it kept going on like that, it would grow. Other years where the opposite is true. And it really allows us to produce a very detailed understanding of how the glaciers behave in response to climate. So you've got Brewster representing a typical Southern Alps glacier, and then you have these almost end member examples like the Franz Josef, the Tasman Glacier, and using observational studies of these glaciers and also of local climate, you've generated what you call an energy balance model. So in other terms, a mass balance model for the Southern Alps. Yeah. And then, as I understand it, the ultimate goal is to couple that model to one that simulates the dynamics of ice sheets. So you'll have effectively a single holistic model for the sort of glacio-climatic setting of the Southern Alps. Yeah, the ice flow part, the ice sheet model, if you like, that's kind of complicated, especially because of all these processes that I've been describing, like lakes forming and debris on the surface of glaciers and everything. It's very hard to incorporate that into a standard ice sheet model. We're sort of working on it. I mean, we've got a new project at the moment where we're trying to incorporate some of these factors. But I can talk about the energy balance model. That is designed to really just simulate the processes that occur on a glacier from year to year, like snowfall and melt. Because we have data from a few glaciers like the Brewster Glacier, we also have some from Tasman and Franz, Joseph Glaciers and so forth. We can use that to help validate this model, work out whether it's doing a reasonable job. The advantage of this model is that we can ask it questions, specific questions about recent or future glacier behaviour. We can work out what has actually been causing recent ice volume changes in the Southern Alps. Was it temperature? Was it precipitation? You can do that. You can hold the temperature constant and just let precipitation vary as we know it has and see what effect that has on the glaciers. Or we can turn off precipitation, just make it constant and vary temperature and see what happens to the glaciers. And if you do that, you can see that the temperature impact is very large and the precipitation impact is sometimes significant, but it's overall not as large. So these models allow you to sort of investigate different scenarios. I wouldn't want to say play games, but it's a little like that. You can 
ask yourself a question, and then just allow the model to provide an answer. It's not always going to be perfect, but it does give you some sense of how the system works. So is it possible to use this model to help reconstruct glacial advances that correspond to, say, major, well-dated moraine sequences, and therefore, obviously, letting you estimate the climatic conditions that would have existed at those times? Let me just talk about the energy balance model for a moment, because in that case, it's a well-constrained period, say the last 30 years. We know what the climate's been doing. We have very detailed measurements from weather stations. And so we can use the model to calculate the volume changes of snow and ice in the Southern Alps. We can then compare that record directly to the advance and retreat of Franz Josef Glacier. And we can see that our model produces a near perfect fit with that record. It's not identical. There's actually an offset of about five years or so between the two data sets. And that's due to the response time of the glacier. It takes a while for that changing climate to manifest itself in a changing glacier length. So we know for at least the last few decades that the model's doing a pretty good job at simulating the changes in snowfall and ice melt that ultimately cause glacier length changes. For the past, it's more scenario based. We've tried to simulate the climate that might produce the advance of a glacier to a particular moraine like the Waiho Loop, a well-known, quite contentious moraine in the Southern Alps near Franz Josef Glacier. We can work out what combinations of temperature and precipitation could be required to do that. That's pretty useful because, you know, glacial geologists spend a lot of time working out the age and, you know, the structure of these moraines, and we provide a link that can help them understand the paleoclimate, the past climate that produced those advances. But I wouldn't say that we've got to the stage yet where we've really been able to simulate those changes through time properly. We could do it really quite nicely for something like Franz Josef Glacier, Fox Glacier, Stocking Glacier, any of those clean glaciers, no problem. But the trouble is that most of the ice volume in the Southern Alps is actually locked up in these dirty glaciers with lakes in front of them, the complicated ones. And that's a real problem for us. It's going to limit our ability to produce accurate predictions of future glacier extent. We're trying. We just wrote a Marsden application to try to do this for the last few thousand years. Jeez, is that how long it takes to write a Marsden application? <laughs> <laughs> just about. <laughs> so from your modelling work so far, do you have any general predictions about how the ice masses of the New Zealand Southern Alps might respond to a warmer world of the future? We know that if the climate warms by even just a few degrees, that will overwhelm any precipitation feedbacks, right? So if the world gets two degrees warmer, it would need to get four times as wet in order to balance that. What that really means is that any relatively small warming will cause a glacier retreat. We don't know exactly how much that will be yet, but even without using the models, you can just get some indication of that from what's happened in the last century. I mean, temperature has risen by about 0.6 of a degree during the 20th century, and there's been three, four kilometres of glacier retreat in response to that. Just imagine what a two degree warming is going to do. You might get four times that. Franz Joseph Glacier is only about 11 kilometres long. It means that it will all be gone with just a few degrees of warming. I suspect that a two or three degree warming will get rid of most of New Zealand's glaciers. You'll just be left with a few ice patches clinging to the highest peaks like Mount Cook or Mount Tasman. Yeah, it's a depressing thought. I guess, at least within the scope of the ANZICE program, the ultimate goal of your modelling work is to be able to advise policymakers on how to manage in the years to come those water and energy resources that these glaciers represent. But you're a glaciologist, you're obviously very passionate about glaciers. What are your feelings about the intrinsic value of glaciers to New Zealand and more generally, as opposed to viewing them from a purely economic standpoint? I guess I'm not focused on those economic impacts, even though I think they're really important, right? It's obvious. And it sometimes comes home to me when I talk to somebody who works, say, for example, in the guiding industry on Franz Josef Glacier or something. Their direct livelihood is affected by what happens there. As a scientist, I guess I'm just fascinated by ice itself. It's a beautiful thing. It never ceases to sort of get me excited when I go and visit glaciers. And I also see the future response of glaciers as a fundamentally interesting topic to study. If you divorce it from its real and tangible and very serious impacts on humanity, it's just a fascinating thing. What's going to happen? Are they going to break up? Are they going to grow? You know, it's a sort of complex puzzle that we can work on. I think they already are national icons. I mean, tourists come to New Zealand for our landscape. That's my impression anyway. 
they want to go to Milford Sound and Franz Joseph Glacier and all this kind of thing. So a lot of that topography has been either produced by glaciers or is currently being produced by glaciers. So I, I think they're already important. Maybe New Zealanders, you know, need to think about them a little bit more often. But they are icons, they're very beautiful. I think if we lost them, then uh, we'd lose a pretty fundamental aspect of our environment. For more journeys to the ice, visit cyblogs.co.nz forward slash journeys to the ice.